everyone and welcome to Esquire's Man at His Best podcast. This is our weekly look at some of the biggest things that have happened this week in the world of men's lifestyle, including updates from our very own website and magazine. So my name is Tom and I'm the digital director of Esquire Middle East and as per usual, I'm joined by a very special guest. He's a man who... Oh, that's right. So uh, it's just me this week because Matt is uh, sunning himself in Italy while the rest of the team slave away under the summer sun in Dubai. No matter though, I guess this gives us an opportunity to to go back through the archives and present to you lovely podcast listeners a few of our best bits. So sit back and enjoy this one man show. I'll be back after the best bits. Well, I suppose there's, there's two bits of news that I have. One, I will go in because we're gearing up to the World Cup kicking off on June 14th this year in mm-hmm. Russia. Uh, FIFA World Cup. Uh, I'm a big football fan. Tom, less such a football fan. No, so, World Cups, though. Uh, World Cups are always countries forever. versus countries. It's like the big leagues versus the other leagues, which I just, yeah. there's too much football, if anything. Yeah, At yeah. least this comes around once every four years. That's, my, that's the amount I can deal with. Yeah. Yeah, one no. tournament. No, every two years because I like I like the Euros. So yeah. one big tournament every two years. I'm happy. Yeah, fair enough. I, that, it's a good way in for football fan, casual football fans as well. Um, it's just very intense. A lot of lot of football going on. But what I want to talk about is Nike have released their new World Cup boot. Uh, they do every tournament. Uh, it's always a big thing in in the in the football kind of. Uh, Kind of apparel and uh, and accessories industry. Nike's release, Adidas's release, Reebok's release, um, Umbro. Um, but Nike's one is 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 the pick that I'm going to go with this year. Uh, What's the difference? What, what makes well, it basically? It, it's all white, Tom. It's gone with an all white boot. But see, the problem with that is that it's going to get scuffed. Yeah, but when you're playing at that real level, like the elite level, it doesn't really matter. But when I say it's all white, what they've actually done is it's white canvas and then it's customizable. So they've released four different boots named after their kind of typical uh, traditional Nike boots, which is mm-hmm. the the Mercurial, the Hyper Venom, the, the Magistia, and the Tempo. Okay. Um, and each one comes up with a white surface, but it's actually the sole where they come with like neon orange colors, neon green, blues, reds. Um, it looks really really good so it's completely white except for the bottom yeah which is like these kind of uh very kind of hyper realistic plastics neon colors yeah didn't nike do this in the olympics in london where everyone who had neon like green shoes they were nike because you weren't allowed branding correct and is nike a sponsor for nike the world cup? yes uh well no nike isn't a sponsor for the world cup but they are a sponsor of team, team kits yeah and also some of the players. Got so that. someone like Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, is a Nike athlete. Yeah. Uh, so is the England team are sponsored by Nike, so Nike produce their, their, their gear. What color will Ronaldo's shoes be? I don't know yet. He hasn't revealed that yet. White. You will have to tune white, white, answer, white is the answer to that. Um, what is nice about these is that you can actually customize them in store as well. So if you want your Welsh, I mean, Wales aren't in the World Cup, but if you, you went into the store, you can actually if you pay a bit extra, you can actually get your flag embroidered on the boot as well. That's quite nice. Just to show a little bit of that nationalistic pride that, that the World Cup brings out in people. And then again, they're all white, so if you get them dirty, you just throw them in the washing machine and they tumble around and then they get clean. Is yeah, correct. Right? Or most of the pictures I play on here in Dubai are basically synthetic, so there's not a lot of scuffing on the white things. They look cool as well. Is the World Cup synthetic? Uh, no, no, it'll be on grass. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I can't count for all how many stadiums there are, 12, 8, something like that, but, but generally it's on grass. Russian grass? Russian, sweet, sweet Russian grass. Mm-hmm. Um, so the new collection is called the Just Do It Collection, I imagine, because, you know. Um, Fair. And, uh, I mean, a little unimaginative at this, at this point. Yeah. I mean, we could do a different, we could, they could do it a different slogan. The, um, and basically, the, just look out for those kind of metallic colored swooshes, I believe that's the, that's the phraseology they're using for the colors. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, pretty, it's, it's one of those sports geeky things. I'm totally into it. Um, I'll be uh, popping along to the Nike store to pick up those in time for the World Cup. I'll be wearing them on my sofa, don't worry. On your sofa? Yeah. Got a, it's quieter. I've got a child. She'll wake up if you're clip-clopping with, your, uh, with the studs on the, uh, on, the, on the ground. Fair enough. Space alien news. I like space alien news. So, there's a new theory that says that what is essentially, I'll I'll just break it down. Octopuses or octopi, Mm. they could be aliens. Sorry, um, what? 
So essentially, there's new research. Re, re, I'm going <laughs> to make some yeah. quotes over this research. He is but, doing the air quotes for those <laughs> not actually watching on the uh, video. That, that essentially says that octopuses come from imported genes. So now let's let's kind of unpack like that. Levi's, uh, like genotypes. Ah, G with genes with a G. Although imported Levi's is definitely you can definitely get those from mm. from Dubai Mall, mm. uh, Mall of the Emirates. Um, in this case, it's it's genotypes. So what they're saying is, oct. I want to say octopuses. Mm, octopi. But I don't. I, I, I think we go Greek with it. Octopus and octopus has genes that are unlike anything else. And so what this theory suggests is that ba way back when, when we were just primordial ooze, like a big soup, mm -hmm. um, a gene soup, uh, this, this octopus, an octopus riding a comet, landed on Earth, and or its genes did, um, and then it obviously uh, made more octopuses, octopi, uh, and yeah, octopuses, aliens. Who knew? This is some fantastic research that you've put in here. This It's called, um, it's a theory known as panspermia. One more time for Big Fudge. Panspermia, which argues that life on Earth was seeded by biological material transported from elsewhere in the universe. Hence, the octopus. The humble octopus. So the humble octopus was traveling through space and he left his genes somewhere and now aliens. Well, essentially, um, it's down to the octopuses. One octopus is single, but it's it's so it is octopuses nervous system um, uh, as well as its camera like eyes, its flexibility and its camouflage abilities, which appear nowhere else. I like the idea that you're if you're in a lab and you're studying this and you've come to a conclusion and the conclusion is, of all the research is I don't know aliens. Yeah, fair. I'll use it. Uh, so yeah, but I didn't see. Potentially, this could be used um, as a plot device in a future X Files or Marvel films. Deadpool three, space genes. Fair. Yeah, like European Vacation, but Fair. better, bigger crew, add more characters. Octopus. Yeah, uh, add an octopus character. Octopi. Yeah, Nathan the octopus, something like yeah. Uh, we were talking about World Cup earlier. Mm. Remember the world, the octopus that picked all the winners for the World Cup? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think what he was, was his name. I th I, that's why when you said Nathan, I thought you were referencing that. No, I'll come to me. I'll Google it. Yeah, but also, you know, octopus are very smart. Are they? Yeah, they're pretty smart. Well, they've got they're aliens. Yeah. So you know, but they're not superior extraterrestrial beings. Also delicious. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that's open for negotiation. But it's a bit, bit of, but it's dilemma though, isn't it? I'm going for Japanese food tonight, Tom. Are you? Yeah. Delicious. I'm going tomorrow night. <laughs> Right, cool. So that's that's the news. Um, so I move on to the second segment, which I'm calling Inside the Magazine. This segment is a, will be a regular segment that we do on the podcast. It is essentially a look at what we have right here now for those who are not watching us. I've just held up the April 2018 issue of Esquire Middle East. Um, it's a strapping young man called DJ Khaled on the cover in an orange suit. You can't go wrong with it. Um, it's, uh, it's chock full of, uh, it's chock full this month. Uh, but what we will do in this segment is we will highlight one particular feature and uh, and just delve into it a little bit more and uh, and break it down. So this week uh, we are looking at, well, it's something I found very interesting. It was a trip I went on in January earlier this year where I was invited along very kind of exclusively to Switzerland, to Geneva, to go behind the scenes of Rolex. Mm -hmm. The king of watches. Yeah, very much so. And and for those who are not too kind of interested or, or aware of, of watches, you know, we all know Rolex. It's a it's a brand that stands next to, you know, Coke and Ferrari and McDonald's and, you know, the, of global significance and relevance and, and really kind of stands for something just in that kind of five letter name. But what you may not know is essentially being invited to Rolex is like being invited to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You know, it's it's quite a. Um, I call it secretive. They would they kind of told me that they were a, a more conscious brand. Mm. They're very kind of uh, protective of what they have. They're privately owned, mm. so they're under no kind of obligation to share 
facts and figures and stock prices and 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 uh, and invite people in. Um, and they generally tend to keep to themselves a lot. They don't like to reveal what's going on until they're ready. And the actual to actually be invited there to visit not one, not two, but four different factories in different parts of, or three in Geneva and one outside uh, near the Jura Valley is um, it's it's a bit of an honor. It's uh, and it was sure eye opening. Um, so I've seen Charlie in the chocolate factory. Yes, N not a lot of good befell a lot of them. And but little Charlie, he ended up having the the keys to the chocolate factory. Well, uh, do you now have the the keys to the Rolex Empire, having survived the trials? Well, this is this was the bit where I was going to announce why I'm stepping away from Esquire to go and run Rolex purely on the fact that knew everyone else ate too much chocolate and that that bubbling candy that makes you go up to the roof, the even greedy. though you were distinctly told not to touch any of it. So. Um, Congratulations! There you are. Thank you very much. I'm a very proud, proud new owner of a <laughs> multi-billion-dollar watch company, world-leading watch company. So, what was the most impressive thing about your trip? You know what? Actually, surprisingly, um, Rolex make their own gold. Tom, what do you mean they make it? How do you? You can't make gold. Well, yes, admittedly, but basically, there's a thing called Rolex Ever Rose Gold. Mm -hmm. Now, basically, what they do is they take 24 karat gold mm -hmm. in one of their factories. They smelt it down use smelt. It with an alloy to basically create a, an 18 karat gold, mm. which then they use because the, it adds more rigidity to the structure of it because gold can be quite malleable. Yeah, you'd wear it, you'd bang it, and then the watch would Correct. have a massive dent in it. It's like when you have pirates yeah. and they have coins made of gold and they're biting on it to see if it bends and scratches off. That's how you know it's real gold. That is a very good analogy. Thank you. Thought of it myself. Mm. Um, and yes, yeah, so the, the level and the detail of Roller, I mean, basically all that is part of their vertically integrated system, which basically means they make everything that they do. Everything you see on that watch is made in-house. What with the glass? Except the glass and the screws. The screws? There's some couple of, well, not all the screws, but there's a couple of tiny screws that they outsource. But basically it was a big uh, decision to make uh, back in the, in the 90s where they... They took the entire watchmaking process. They had all their suppliers and everything, and they just bought out the companies and bought it all mm. in-house. Therefore, they can absolutely unquestionably guarantee that Rolex have approved and checked every single watch that comes out of their, their factories um, with guarantees that they offer a thing called a superlative uh, guarantee, mm. uh, which, again, is trademarked to them and uh, the only people that do it. And it comes a lovely green badge when you um oh yeah on the back yeah 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 um so yeah so but what that means is they're able to control the level of quality that they push to be irreplaceable and un you know uh, unchallengeable in in the watch world that's why rolex has the position that it has that's why it has the price point that it has and that's why they say you know that it is the best watch in the world and it is the most kind of sought after watch in the world it's the consistency it's the number it's the volume that they put out per year which they won't release official figures mm. for but i i'm estimating again this is an estimate of around a million pieces a I year i think that's that's not yeah that that's kind of a benchmark that a lot of people correct but if they're producing a million pieces a year say and the idea is that none of them have any faults well, I guess, that's where the value of Rolex well, comes Well, I guess in. what's the, the question is, so uh, AP, Audemars Piguet, they have, um, they have stopped production at 40,000. I think they're going to up it to 45 over the next two years, but this is quite small. 45,000 watches isn't very much. To, it's more than I have. Well, yes, <laughs> more than I have. But kind of uh, let's go into the supply and demand economics. If you're not producing very many watches, but a lot of people demand them, you can have them at a certain price. Mm. Now, what I don't understand about Rolex is that they're producing not 50,000, not even 500,000. They're producing a million watches mm. and yet can still maintain incredibly high prices for that. Mm. There's, th there's no other company in the world that can operate at that. Even Apple has to produce certain models that go after market share. Mm. So how can, how, why does Rolex do it? How, how does it do it? I think it does it especially in some ways of holding back specific models as well. Look, they have heritage. They have, uh, they don't try to be too, they're very focused on what they do. Mm. They focus on specific lines, specific models, like your Rolex Oyster Perpetual, your GMT, your Submariners, your Daytonas. And each of these do have 
certain models that they make, a certain number that they make per year, mm. which is why, you know, a Rolex Daytona has a waiting list, especially in different models and different materials uh, and different layouts. Um, so they still have that, that want, that desire. They still build that demand. But then there's other products that they, they, they have otherwise. Plus, they have a massive range for, for women as well mm. Uh, mm. and men, uh, which a lot of watch companies uh, don't tend to focus on both. Uh, or as much on both, or in volume uh, as much as both. That's fair. Um, so it's all that. And again, what, you know, it, Apple's an interesting one to, to compare it to. Rolex is massive. Hmm. It's, it's a huge, huge company, and size and scale is very important in what they do. A lot of other watch companies don't have that luxury, even though they may be making, you know, phenomenal pieces of watches. But there is a tendency in, in, in the watch market as well to, re at the moment, to reduce the numbers of limited uh, the, to, to limit the number of watch releases so that they do retain value. Hmm. The interesting thing about Rolex, again, is, you know, it's, it's an old, anyone who's kind of been buying watches or second-hand watches kind of knows as a rule of thumb is that Rolex r retain their value. They do, which, again, is, is, is kind of unheard of outside of your independent watchmakers um, or your, ex your extremely rare, uh, your rare models. But the uh, I was genuinely impressed, um, as I said by the scale, but by the, the, the detail of it all. Um, it was one of the one of the interesting things I found walking around the factory floor is the number of actual um, the the workers who work on the production lines and things. Mm. The number of them who actually have their own Rolexes, and that interested me because I'm pretty sure if you're working on a production line, you're not on a salary that can readily afford you to have Rolex. So I asked someone there. I said, um. You know, do you do you give do you give a uh, Rolex to your staff? Mm. Uh, and a lot of them said, look, we offer them generous discounts, but they choose to wear Rolex because day in day out, that's where they work. Day in day out, they know the passion, they know the the skill, they know the timing and the detail that goes into making them, mm -hmm. and therefore they choose to, you know, it's a personal choice for what you wear. But they, the people who work there, are choosing to spend that much amount of money on 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 a watch that they understand the the story behind it, they understand the work that goes into it. And they get a substantial discount as well. Do you think if you've been at Rolex for 30 years and they were going to give you a present, what would that be? I really think it would be some kind of Swiss chocolate. Fair. Because uh, what I also found out is Rolex, they like things all in-house, Tom. Mm -hmm. So they make their own chocolates. They have their, they're, they're, li they're a literal chocolate factory then. Yeah. Well, you know, Willy Wonka better look out. Fair. Fair. Right then. Um, yes, so going on with that, if you want to read more about my trip to Geneva uh, and Switzerland to inside the watch factory, you can pick up the issue, our uh, April issue, DJ Khaled on the cover. The feature is called Inside Rolex, uh, where we were given a rarely granted access to the watchmaking uh, Goliaths uh, factory just to see the detailing that goes into it. Uh, it's, I mean, I wrote it, it's, it's probably fantastic. Uh, but then, you know, I would say that I'm biased. Yes, you are. You own Rolex. I did. I do. <laughs> do you want a job? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> And that was that, another podcast and the first one that I've ever done solo. It was a wild ride, but I'm glad we got to the end together. Remember, we have new episodes coming out weekly on Apple iTunes, SoundCloud, Pocket Casts, and more, as well as hosting each individual show on our website, EsquireAndMe.com. Oh, and please don't forget to check out our YouTube and social media accounts for more daily goings-on from Esquire Middle East, which is the largest luxury lifestyle title in the Middle East, if not the world. Next week, I'll be back with my actual co-host. Um, his holiday will be over. And so, I'll see you then.